Let's, we'll be getting started in just a minute, so please take your seats. Can you hear me okay? Because we are being telecast. So raise your hand if you're having trouble hearing. Can you hear okay? Telecast working okay? All right. Uh, my name is David Bishai, uh, and I am the chair of the organizing committee. And I just wanted to thank the Department of International Health uh, for sponsoring this event. Um, we also obviously need to thank Professor Carl Taylor, who founded the Department of International Health and really played a major role in there being an Alma Ata Declaration to celebrate. Um, so I will turn it over to Dean Ellen McKenzie, who will say a few words of welcome. At the end, there'll be copies of Johns Hopkins Magazine. If you haven't already gotten one, you can turn to, to more reading on how Alma Ata has affected our school. Well, thanks, David. Um, uh, welcome to everybody. I want to welcome everybody who's here and also extend um, a particular welcome to those of you who are joining us online uh, uh, during this uh, uh, webcast. Um, I'd also like to um, take this opportunity to thank all of our partners who, uh, from a variety of different organizations who were gathering uh, most of the morning um, uh, to talk about um, th through a roundtable uh, to talk about how we can move forward in, um, uh, with a consensus statement um, on achieving health for all. So thank you for all of your time and all your, your valuable input. And finally, I'd like to make a special welcome to Dr. Rita Tapa, um, an alumna of the school. And you'll be hearing a lot more about her in a few minutes, but thank you for being here and welcome. We're gathered here together to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Alma Ata Declaration, which, as most of you know, was endorsed on September 12, 1978, in Alma Ata, um, Alma Ata, Kazakhstan, under the motto of Health for All. This is a particularly special um, occasion for the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, as we um, uh, had um, uh, something to do with the uh, development of this declar declaration. And in particular, um, Dr. Carl Taylor, who, as many of you know, is a founding chair um, of our Department of International Health, uh, was engaged in writing the declaration and the background documents uh, for the Alma Mata Conference um, and uh, 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 contributed a lot uh, to uh, the declaration. His family, uh, several members of, of whom are here with us today, has stayed engaged with Hopkins and the School of Public Health and continue to pursue efforts to further the vision of health uh, for all with communities around the world. Our current faculty, including many of our youngest um, uh, faculty here today, help us uh, carry on the vision of Alma Ata into the future. And I wanted to give a special shout out to Drs. Perry, Brieger, uh, Edward, and Bashai, um, who ha um, have, have been particularly inspired um, by Alma Mata and have um, continued to uh, inspire others uh, here at the school and throughout the world. And they are responsible for bringing us all here together. So thank you um, all for, uh, for doing that. This inspiration informs how we work with communities, governments, donors, and other stakeholders around the world. At the School of Public Health, uh, we recognize now more than ever before the importance of ensuring that all people, particularly the most, most vulnerable communities, have a voice and an opportunity to pursue their health and well-being in a spirit of self-determination. We are gathered here today to share the timeless inspiration that Alma Ata has offered the, public, uh, offered the field of public health as well as many other disciplines and very importantly, to reflect on how the vision um, that, uh, uh, that was set forth in this historic declaration can guide us to work more effectively in the future to achieve our shared aspiration of health for all people. With those few um, uh, brief introductory remarks, it's my pleasure to introduce Henry Taylor, who will give you an introduction to our esteemed uh, plenary speaker. He is well known to many, if not most of you in this room. Uh, Dr. Taylor is a deputy health officer um, at uh, the Cecil uh, County Health Department. 
Uh, he received his MD from Harvard, um, but very importantly, his MPH from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So we count him as an alum and a very important and a very active alum. Uh, he continues to uh, work with us in teaching and um, uh, on a variety, in a variety of different ways, and we're, we're thrilled to have him with us today. And very importantly, um, he is the son of uh, Carl Taylor, and uh, who started all of this many, many years ago. Uh, so Henry, welcome, and um, uh, please um, come and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dean McKenzie, and uh, welcome, and particular welcome. It's an honor to be able to introduce um, Dr. Rita Tapa, uh, and a lot of you are aware of it, so I don't want to go into too much of um, her background that's, and repeat that. But um, what's remarkable is that her career not only spans the globe uh, with the usual list of um, accolades. She was served in WHO regional offices in Manila, Geneva, and New Delhi and then retired in 2001 as the Director of Health Systems and Community Health. So she had all that policy stuff and she served on all the long list of committees and awards and um, I'll spare you that part. Uh, because what's really important is that um, for today is that her illustrious career also spans the entire uh, effort of primary health care and that hearing her story there's something about we were talking in the um, activity just before this about being focused on measurement which is necessary that's why folks are here is to do the measurement publish the papers do the research but what I think we'll hear today is really the stories the quality the deeper spirit of what primary health care is about um, and you started as a frontline clinician in a maternity hospital, uh, seeing babies die, maternal deaths, and you knew that things were preventable, uh, that these things had some basic uh, activities that could um, change the lives of people in Nepal, and particularly those who were most underserved. Um, and because of that, she said, well, I need to learn what to do about it. And she came to Hopkins and got her MPH in 1965. Uh, so you must have been about five years old, right? Um, but, <laughs> but she came and got her MPH in 65 and then went back to Nepal and was the first medical officer in charge of Nepal's family planning and maternal child health project, um, part of which involved being the boss to my brother, which isn't an easy thing to do, um, uh, and then spent the next decade establishing the National Family Planning and End MCH program, and that's a point that I want to really highlight. Um, Hafdan Mahler, prior to Almada, had her as a special advisor um, in the build-up to it because of that work that she had been doing in Nepal, where she was already making a notable difference. And um, then she went on to, well, to be at WHO and do all the work. I want to get through. Um, what's striking is during that time, just prior to Almada and after her MPH, she um, built a, uh, you worked through a network. The network already existed of women's organizations, the, women in the different villages, and you work through that network to, um, to deliver family planning and maternal child health services that the women really wanted. Uh, others came in later and claimed credit. Um, if you look at the history, people say it started with the FCHV program in 1988, but what you'll hear today is the roots go much deeper uh, to the work that um, Rita did. And you were able to do that because you built trust with the women in the villages, giving them the reproductive health services that they really needed and desired. Uh, part of that involved, well, one thing was you stood up to arrogant expatriates, uh, one of which actually told you that no man should ever have to work under a woman. Uh, so Dean McKenzie, take caution on that. Um, 
But you also, in the course of it, it was a time when there was this thing called PL480 money, and USAID kept offering this money under um, following the US political agenda to stop the population explosion. And you stood up to that sort of single-minded magic bullet effort um, because there was kind of an implicit bias going on here that why should we take care of mothers and children while we're doing family planning? If we're worried about the population explosion, why would we want them to live and survive and be happier and healthier? Um, and your insistence that it had to be an integrated program of reproductive health with nutrition, with family planning, uh, really has made remarkable differences. And I think you're too modest to often bring that out, but the ability to resist uh, the pressure, the political pressure donors impose and speak for the women is really remarkable. Um, and that was recognized by Dad, by Jack Bryant, by Hoftan Mahler, uh, as you advocated for the integrated programs at the community level and um, ones that people could understand, embrace, and truly own. Um, I witnessed this in um, 1982 and 1989. Uh, we retraced Dad's steps as he walked up the Kali Gandaki, going from the Tarai jungles all the way up into the mountains. And um, he had done the first health survey in 1949, first published health survey in Nepal. And so we had actually several data points to actually witness and see the differences that had been made. And I think you'll talk about that um, later on. So your life story really gives witness to the core principles of primary health care that were articulated in Almada. And for those of you who haven't had a chance, not just the declaration, but the executive report has a lot of ideas that are fairly well refined there um, that accompanies it. Um, in closing, uh, let me say among your numerous international awards, degrees, and honors, I noticed that one of your two Nepali knighthoods translates into English as the Order of the Gurkha Right Arm. And I think that's a fitting description for somebody who, as a teenager, won three national championships in badminton. <laughs> so help me uh, welcome to her academic home, Dr. Rita Tapa. My mouth was getting dry, so I'll pour you some water here. Some water. Yeah. This group can be pretty intimidating, so yeah. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, I better be careful. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Dr. Rita Thapa. I'm from Kathmandu. Namaskar to all of you. And thank you, Ellen, uh, Dean Ellen McKenzie, for your kind welcome. And, and thank you, my Kancho Bhai, <laughs> Dr. Hen Dr. Dr. Henry Taylor, for introducing me so gloriously. I don't know whether I deserved all that. Respected chairperson, moderator, Professor David Bishai, alumni, Dr. Hen Henry Taylor, my another bigger brother, alumni, Dr. Daniel Taylor. I'm so happy he's in, in, in today is present here. Esteemed faculty members of the working group and students, of the 40th anniversary of the Almata Declaration and distinguished guests. I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to Professor David Bisai and to all of the faculty and students, members of the organizing group of the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health 
for inviting me as a keynote speaker on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the Almata Declaration. As one of the attendees present at that historical declaration, I feel extremely honored to be celebrating its 40th birthday at this prestigious campus where I, I learned the ABCs of public health some 50, more than 50 years ago. I was the first woman from Nepal to come to attend the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. After obtaining my degree in public health, I went head starting Nepal's maternal child health and family planning project. And to have a long career in Nepal and internationally at the World Health Organization. I offer my gratitude to my all teachers of then for transmitting me their invaluable knowledge of public health. I would especially like to offer a deep tribute to the legendary professor, late Carl E. Taylor, for teaching me the cardinal health mantras that have guided me throughout my career. I grew up in Nepal at a time when girls' formal education was illegal. Marriage was the only career option available. Thanks to my unusually liberal father, I was able to escape such fate. Nepal's modernization began in 1951 with ushering in of the first wave of democracy. I am a proud product of that wave, which among other things, also legalized girls' education. The health situation at that time was grim. With the average, with grim, as described accurately by Professor Carl E. Taylor, in his medical survey of Kali Gandaki and Pokhara, which is likely the first ever health report of Nepal. The country's total population was then 8 million, with an average life expectancy of 40 years. 10% of the, only 10% of the total population were literate with 37% of all deaths occurring among infants. Unattended, home delivery was universal, with maternal death taken as normal aspect of being a woman. From this fact alone, one can easily understand why the maternal mortality ratio was at its natural level, that is 1,500 or more so per 100,000 live births. The under five mortality rate was more than 300 to 400 per 1,000 live births. And the percentage of married women using contraceptives was at zero level. A considered national health development Development of public health began with the country's first five-year plan, that is 1957 to 62, with the Malaria Eradication Project. My career trajectory, trajectory in public health began against this backdrop. With my first job as a medical officer at the country's first maternity hospital in Kathmandu. There I observed most women came to the hospital with repeated pregnancies in the very last stages with life-threatening complications. At one point, I bluntly asked a few of them, why do you want to get pregnant all the time? They retorted, 
we are not like you. After marriage, we have to do what our husband wants. Through these interactions, I learned the disempowerment of women. I learned their, they don't have any choice in their own reproductive health and issue of gender disempowerment. That left me with a huge personal challenge. How could I empower women to overcome the syndrome of repeated unwanted pregnancy? If only that had access, if only they had access to basic family planning and prenatal health care services, so many deaths and disabilities could have been prevented. This is why I came to Johns Hopkins to study public health. I had to leave my firstborn child of 11 months to come here, which was very hard for me, as you all will understand. But I could do it with the support of my husband. From Johns Hopkins, I went in, in 1965 to become the first medical officer in charge of Nepal's family planning and maternal childhood project. The government of Nepal had adopted a family planning policy in its third periodic planning period, spanning from 1965 to 1970. The purpose was to balancing economic and population growth. Family planning since then became an integral component of maternal and child health. Together they took off as a priority health program in Nepal. But I had never imagined of facing so many anomalies. As Nepal had no prior policy, experience, program, and health infra infrastructure, starting at family planning MCS project felt like a mission impossible. <laughs> the first major anomaly that bothered me deeply was that while repeated unwanted pregnancies constituted a risk to women and children's lives, there was no mention of family planning in the medical textbook I studied previously as a medical student. At the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, I finally learned about MCS, family planning, and population dynamics. I returned home carrying a few lipis loops. I don't know, many of you may not have seen it. It is, a, it is the earliest version of the intrauterine contraceptives, <laughs> which looked a little bit like an earring, you know, <laughs> like that. So I, I used to advocate contraceptives use by dangling it as a medicine to Nepal's poor health and poverty. The other major serious anomaly was related to the severe lack of trained health human resources of any kind. The delivery of family planning and MCS services, regardless of its nature, relied entirely on medical doctors in the prevalent paradigm of that time. But medical doctors were the rarest of commodities. Thus, despite growing political pressure to fast track MCS family planning, the project could not go beyond Kathmandu for several years. It was due to lack of trained health personnel of all categories. The gap between the limited supply and human resources, supply of human resources, and the increasing demand for family planning, MCS services were huge and ever widening. The prevailing health paradigm was obviously unable to respond to the existing needs. Unless some innovative solution was found, we could not deliver on the political aspiration to expand family planning and MCS 
across the country. In a desperate response, we undertook a functional analysis study in the family planning MCS clinics in Kathmandu. Our findings showed that many of the tasks undertaken by doctors did not actually require their presence. In view of this finding, we conceived the idea of creating an entirely new category of basic health work workers, primarily consisting of local women, to deliver specific services as trained for. These were called health aids. Before approaching the government for approval, I consulted Dr. Ira Bendaik, the WHO Maternal Child Health Advisor, who was working with me at that time. She responded succinctly, although such health aids were not in WHO policy, but as a sovereign country, Nepal could decide if it was good for the country. So I got clearance from WHO at least. But it was not as easy to convert our evidence-based data into a government policy. Our proposal of creating a new category of health workers called health aids met hostility from both medical professionals as well as from government bureaucracies, specifically from the Ministry of Finance. The Finance Ministry official I met instantly rejected it as calling it an unsustainable idea, <laughs> arguing that Nepal was too poor to pay the salaries of hundreds of health workers, even though external donors might temporarily fund it. I was deeply disappointed, but did not give up. I tried to, as a tactic, I tried to boost his ego instead of arguing with him. <laughs> I replied, what are you saying, sir? Everyone I meet believe that you are the most brilliant economist in Nepal. <laughs> and you will soon make, our, make Nepal prosperous, and so that even a rural citizen can have basic health care. Flattery worked. <laughs> he approved our proposal there and then. <laughs> In 1967, His Majesty's Government of Nepal finally approved our proposal to recruit and train 104 health aides, mostly women. This was, a, this was a moment, very important moment, when we succeeded to breaking the old health paradigm that had failed to respond to MCS family planning service needs. However, our policy action had it to withstand another difficult test, the acceptance of the communities. That was very important. In view of the fact that nursing school of, in Kathmandu was half empty, given Nepali society's conservative outlook on gender, I was worried whether any women would even be allowed by their families to apply for training as health aides. But soon, and by chance, One incident erased my worries. In 1968, I was in Ilam district, east of Nepal, to open new MCS family planning clinics. Around midnight, a health assistant woke me up to show me a severely dehydrated toddler lying listlessly on her mother's lap. Initially, I panicked. I had nothing at hand to treat such case. Yet, I had to do something as a medical doctor. I improvised instantly an oral version of a saline drip and instructed the mother to make medicine water 
by boiling about five tea glasses of water with a pinch of salt and the fistful of sugar. And so, and let it cool and feed the child intermittently, even while breastfeeding her. Having done that, what I could, I prayed and went back to sleep. But with a lingering feeling, fear that I might hear the mother wailing at any time. I did not hear any such wailing though. At around five in the morning, when I opened the door very slowly, I saw a miracle, truly a miracle. The child was playing on her mother's lap. This proved to be a eureka moment for me. It erased any doubt in my mind about innovating new solutions suited to Nepal. It showed how to scale family planning MCH nationwide. Let me explain. The incident empirically proved three things that could save lives. One, a simple homemade medicine water. We call it nunchini pani, salt, sugar, water. Could save thousands of children's lives. That is how the modern commercially produced oral dehydration solution called Jeevan Jol was born in Nepal. Second, mothers could prepare and administer simple life-saving technologies such as this. And thirdly, most important, mothers could also change their health behavior as the woman did by feeding her child medicine water, contrary to folk norms of restricting water during diarrhea. What I learned from that incident resonated what Professor Carl Taylor had been saying, else, saying all along. Train mothers as the number one healthcare providers. Use homes and communities as the number one healthcare facility. Regard behavior change as the number one medicine for true health. After this, there was no stopping us. <laughs> we went on training community-based health aides who were mostly married women to deliver basic MCS family planning services in their own communities. It was particularly rewarding for us to find health aides willing and even eager to return to their own communities after training, unlike nurses and doctors. Not only did health aides meet the acute shortage of human resources, they also formed a pool of experienced candidates to recruit for further professional training. Over the years, the initial name health of health aids was changed to village health workers. I will explain it later. More importantly, my hope for them came true. During Nepal's sixth periodic planning period, spanning from 1980 to 85, the government decided on its own to support the cost of village health workers' salaries from its own regular budget. So it was not drawn to any foreign donors from its own taxpayers' money. Now with the deployment of community-based health aids, we were able to reach out to communities delivering a set of few safe, doable, and proven health interventions. A few examples of such interventions include health education, communication about basic hygiene, about family planning, about the homemade oral dehydration that I have described, about immunization, about breastfeeding, about screening of under five children's malnutrition by using mid-arm circumference tape, about infant and child feeding, 
about treatment and prevention of protein calorie malnutrition with homemade and affordable foods such as traditional gruel called Lito in Nepali, which has since gone into commercial production as Sarbotam Pitu. But I also had my gender battles to fight while I was in maternal child health family planning project. I was insistent on keeping, as a woman, I believe this very dearly, it is benefit, beneficial for women and children that to keeping family planning and maternal child health services as single integrated package delivered from one door. But a male representative from a very powerful major donor agency wished to separate family planning from MCH, as was the practice in neighboring countries. The idea of separation did not sit well without field evidence, which showed integrated MCS family planning services to be more synergistic and holistic, while family planning services offered maternal child health and infrastructure. MCS developed rapport for family planning among MCS clients, winning their trust and providing an excellent contact point for family planning motivation. To my shock, I learned that not only did this male representative of a donor agency provoke the predominantly male staff in my office not to work under a woman, he also went on to lobby for my transfer from the project. However, thanks to the political leadership of that time, the government stood firmly by the side of the integrated approach. I was not surprised to hear a few years later that he was expelled from work for his anti-woman behavior. <laughs> My other major primary healthcare journey began in 1975. When the government appointed me the chief of Nepal's primary health care project called Integrated Community Health Service Development. This was a mega project born out of an imminent threat of resurgence of malaria. Nepal's malaria eradication project, which has started as the first development project in 1957, had reached its targeted maintenance level by 1972. But there was no basic health infrastructure to maintain this gain. This is when the government changed its policy from a vertical to integrated approach, creating the Integrated Community Health Service Development Project. It was not easy. I still remember. I really shudder, you know, sometimes how I did it. It wasn't easy to bring the functions and operations of the five vertical projects under single administrative umbrella of the Department of Health Services. This, among many other works, also entailed endless discussions and arguments with my five brothers, I used to call them, the five vertical project chiefs who were united in their opposition to an integrated approach. But we worked on a war footing to establish a countrywide network of integrated district health offices, integrated health posts, and linking them with the village health workers, mothers group, and female community health volunteers within the districts. We institutionalized the basic primary health care services provided by the five vertical projects by organizing them along an integrated district level health system while safeguarding their service quality down to community level. Finally, we all agreed to unify all of the community based health workers of the five respective particular projects under single name called village health workers. For example, 
smallpox vaccinators, family planning MCS fam health aides, malaria home visitors were all unified as village health workers, working under the respective integrated health post under their districts. While the job entailed much hard talk and hard work, it gave me an opportunity to innovate of it another category of health workers, the female community health volunteers, a critical link to the community. Here is an interesting story about how family, female community health volunteers came about. In 1978, I submitted to the Ministry of Health a proposal for pilot testing of community health leaders, community health leaders. One in each ward with a population of 1,000 to 2,000 people. But the proposal never received a reply. After a month or so, I requested an appointment with the health secretary. When he saw me, he showered me with remarks such as, I had thought you are an intelligent lady, but you are now proposing to create leaders at every ward. How many leaders do you need in a small country like Nepal? Aren't you happy with our one leader? I understood the political meaning of his words. Nepal was then governed by an absolute monarchy. I apologized and withdrew my proposal. After consulting with my colleagues, we agreed to change the name of community health leaders to female community health volunteers, removing the term leader. A rose is a rose, whatever name may be the name. When I sent the proposal with the changed name, the secretary immediately approved the proposal. I, I felt grateful to him for correcting my politically incorrect vocabulary of that time. After the pilot test, the female community health volunteers went nationwide with the support of USAID. The high point of my journey came to primary health care was my attendance at the 1978 International Conference on Primary Health Care in Almata. The deliberations at the conference were very reminiscent of what I was doing in Nepal. I found Dr. Hartan Mahler's address invigorating, and I was inspired by his call for a new health order. This was the first time I had heard Dr. Hartan Mahler. I was moved by his call for just and lasting ways of bringing health to all. My other unforgettable memories are of late Senator Edward Kennedy. I still remember the electrifying address when he told the audience, and I'm paraphrasing, you eradicated smallpox from the face of the earth. You did so by reaching every home in every village. So now you can reach every home with primary health care. Nothing could have been more uplifting and more inspiring. I return energized, feeling we can do it. Encouraged but nervous, I too shared at this August forum our experience of using village-based community health workers to deliver primary health care services at the grassroots. I felt immensely encouraged to see the Almata Article 7, Article 7 of the Almata Declaration resonated with our experiments in Nepal. I returned home from the Almata feeling exhilarated, encouraged to establish a nationwide network of community-based primary health care system, which I did and went on doing. The government of Nepal endorsed and adapted the Almata Declaration. Accordingly, we continued to weave the principles of Almata Declaration into, our, into the country's community-based health systems. Following the Almata Declaration, I never stopped advocating every WHO regional committee meeting and 
other related meetings I attended for the inclusion of maternal mortality ratio and contraceptive prevalence rate in the original global list of health for all indicators. So what is the mileage we covered? Briefly, all the existing evidence shows a striking difference in health indicators from the benchmark of the 1960s. Allow me to cite a few examples. By 2011, the average lifespan had increased from 40 years to 60 years. Smallpox was eradicated in 1977. Total literacy rate rose from 10% to 66%. By, by 2011, the country met early on all the targets of Millennium Development Goal 4 on child mortality, the only country to do so in South Asia. By 2016, infant mortality rate declined to 32 per thousand live births. Under five mortality rate declined from a high three digit level numerical to 39. Total fertility rate declined from six children per woman to 2.3. Replacement level in urban areas. Contraceptive prevalence rose from zero to 43%. The unmet need for family planning is down to 24%. Institutional rates of delivery shifted from universal unattended home delivery to 57%. The maternal mortality ratio declined from a natural level of, level of 1,500 or more to 239 per 100,000 live births. The percentage of the children aged 12 months to 23 months immunized with full vaccination rose from 0 to 78%. Malaria was effectively controlled. Leprosy was eliminated at public health level by 2009. Nepal celebrated its zero polio status in 2014. Epidemic transmission HIV halted. The new infection significantly reduced by 82% from the last decade to 2015. So what helped Nepal come this far? We may like to ask this question to ourselves. I agree that several interrelated health and social factors come into play to influence health outcomes. However, evidence also shows that unless some proven health interventions are accessible at the population level in continuum from over the time, long period of time, such health gains are not possible. Keeping this, this in mind, I will attempt to track down a few primary healthcare-based policies, strategies, principles that have hugely helped to create a healthy, healthier Nepal today. Firstly, the first is the innovative strategy <clears throat> of breaking away from the old health paradigm to a new that trained and used community-based health workers to deliver primary healthcare services. Training and mobilization of female community health volunteers to deliver an integrated package of interventions has paid back a huge health dividend. As one study puts it, female community health volunteers <coughs> are saviors of women and children, offering basic health services at the grassroots. Another study concludes that the female community health volunteers have effectively contributed to maternal mortality reduction as the country's alternative pathways and strategies. 
Second is Nepal's adoption of an integrated approach. The integrated health system with a country-wide network of more than 50,000 ward-level female community health volunteers and some 4,000 village health workers reached a large number of clients at community level with a proven set of interventions over a long period of time, thus bringing a striking and, I like to emphasize, sustainable health outcomes. For example, maternal and child mortality continued to decline even through a decade-long internal conflicts in Nepal start from 1996 to 2006. It was surprising for us to find out that that was a difficult moment in Nepal. It was a very hard, hard time, but the maternal mortality and child mortality continue to decline. The integrated approach has been found more equitable access to primary health care with better user and provider satisfaction and greater sustainability in communities than those without it. The integrated approach to primary health care was found also cost effective. In terms of disability adjusted healthy life years, Nepal's healthy health outcome over 50 years has, has been higher than its per capita health expenditure of US dollar 41. Third is the sustained policy priority. To the integrated package of essential health care with 77 to 75 percent of government's total health expenditure from 2001 to 2009, which has been a critical factor. Having said that, the question is, what is next? I believe that Nepal's journey to primary health care would be moving forward even more vigorously. The 2015 Constitution of the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal has enshrined basic health services, safe motherhood, women's reproductive health, and children's health as fundamental rights. To this effect, a public health act, which is inclusive, inclusive of the principles of primary health care, is under discussion at the moment in the parliament. This act, when passed, could become an important instrument for revitalizing the ailing health infra infrastructure, intersectoral responsibility, and community self-reliance for realizing free, comprehensive, basic health care services for all. The cost, in conclusion, as a member of the public health team of the old kingdom of Nepal, I feel proud to greet the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal with today's much healthier citizens. The health mileage Nepal has covered so far is no small feat. For a country marred by centuries of feudalism, poverty, illiteracy, discrimination, and virtual absence of any health infrastructure, what has been achieved is a public health breakthrough, a solid foundation for building of universal coverage for public health and basic health services. In short, Nepal's health gains mirror the principle of Almata Declaration in action. The credit for this striking success belongs to every member of Nepal's public health team, from political leadership to the frontline female community health volunteers, including all the external development partners. The ultimate credit should go to women and men in communities for their collective ownership and action. I believe that on his 40th anniversary, 
the Almata Declaration is more relevant than ever, especially in view of, of looming public health threats. For example, the United States is posing a threat to women's reproductive choice and children's right to breastfeeding, which may create a ripple effect globally to reverse the progress we have made jointly. Given this and many other emerging challenges such as non-communicable diseases, there is a great responsibility on us, the public health, we the public health community, to continue to robustly enact the principles of the Almata Declaration. I, for one, am still in the primary healthcare movement. My present focus is on empowering school adolescents to uprooting the risk of cardiovascular and non-communicable disease in Nepal. I thank you all for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. And we have um, some roving microphones. I think we have some roving microphones. Um, and I wanted to, to thank you for, for, for what I heard and how proud it makes me to be on our faculty. This is why we come to this school every day, thinking that we're in 1965 and one of our students is going to graduate, go <laughs> to Nepal, yeah. and do this. This is why we do it. And what she said was, she gives collective credit to the men and women and communities of Nepal. She, she did save lives millions at a time, but she did something more. She transformed Nepal into a place that could save its own lives millions at a time. That's what we want our students to do. I want to thank you, and I want us to get some questions. Please raise your hand and be recognized. Yes. Dr. Thapa, thank you so much for such an inspiring talk over here on the left. Uh, such, such a moving journey. Thank you, uh, it, especially for those of us who are younger alums of, of, of the school. It, it's very, very inspiring. I wanted to ask you about the next 40 years. What do you see as the potential for community-based primary health care? What might it look like in the year um, 2058. That's a very good question. <coughs> Many years ago, when I was training female community health volunteers, they, are, they had asked me, what is our future? We are not salary workers. What would be us? I had replied them, but not knowing exactly, but I assumed that you, you will always be a wanted, self-employed, most precious health worker in the community. Taking from that experience that they are today, you know, our female community health volunteers are not only the backbone of health, but also they are the community leaders. They are the leaders of the community. Now, what happens, because there are many types of, like village health worker, they are the salaried worker. So they have their own career ladder. But sadly in Nepal, you know, those old community health, I mean the village health workers whom I had trained, of course they have become as old as I am. So naturally everybody wants career ladder or something. So some of them have been promoted, which is good, I like it. but. What has not been done to replace them, to train them in their place? Because once they become institutional, they are become institutional staff. They won't go to the communities. They don't link up with the female community health volunteers. So there is a threat. Okay, that, that type of, we have to look at that. Okay, promote, 
but then replace. As far as the community health, female community health volunteers are concerned, they will always be there. They will always be, because they are the part of the communities. You know, and you see, they are, they are the communities, and they are the leaders, and they serve people. And you know, somehow, and also, given the fact that our country has moved from, Nepal has moved from the absolute monarchy to the, to the you know, Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal. So there's a federal, provincial, and local political levels. And it's completely decentralized, and we are in a, we are in a now transition how to decentralize, but it will be decentralized. It is, it is decentralized, and there's a public health act that pulls all the multi-sector together at the local level. So I see, I see no threat, you know, they will only prosper, prosper. They will be more valuable than ever before. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was curious. Um, you mentioned uh, in some points in which you were able to maybe charm the the leaders um, of the the different institutes. Sorry. Please louder. Oh, thank you so much for your presentation. You, yeah. I appreciated some of your anecdotes about charming some of the leaders um, to come along with you. Um, I'm wondering about the other side from the grassroots. What are, what are some of the things that, what are the methods that one can use to have uh, new ideas or new um, input from the grassroots, the people who are local on the ground who are doing the work? Mm -hmm. Actually, I would like to, see, this is a very good question, excellent question. You know, as you know that I'm, I'm back to the villages again, I'm back to the communities again with my new uh, NCD work, you know. And recently, you know, we have, Every time I have a program, somehow, because it's a multi-sector, it's a school, teachers. Teachers are very important people for politicians in the community. So the mayors, they all come, you know, the mayors in many days. One mayor asked me about the NCD because we were talking. She said, what is this? I mean, is the hospital the answer? Because we have increasing <coughs> cases of cancer, diabetes, you know, cardiac arrest, heart attacks. So what is the answer? Is it the hospital or not? So I think he's coming. He told we should need more and more, you know, preventive, more and more health promotion. So I felt that, you know, engaging, engaging the local political leaders and engaging because that gave the support to our local health volunteers, local community-based health workers, and also so many other people. At the same breath, I suggest we should do at the provincial level and at the national level. And at one point, I was so bl blessed, you know, because I got, I don't know that the photograph is there, uh, a parliamentarian attended my class in, uh, um, in one of the districts in in uh, in the in the far in the, in the far west, and she sat down throughout my 45 minutes of class with children, on talking about, on demonstrating what tobacco looks like, what is nicotine, we extracted nicotine and all that, and she was you know she's the member of also the, in the house in the parliament she's also a member of health and education committee. I'm sure that you know that kind of thing will filter down there. So I think, although it's very hard work, you know, for us with the public health people team, but I think we should try to engage as many politicians in our work, showing them what we are doing, and don't give them lecture. Show the experientially. I believe in experiential learning, because our students, when they see what Coca-Cola looks like. I'm sure many of them won't touch it. We show them what Coca-Cola, what is the true picture of Coca-Cola, what is phosphoric acid, how, how much you are drinking it. 
sugar addiction, you know. They realize that, you know. And the similarly, tobacco and also the stress. You know, I'm amazed. I don't know whether you saw any slides that I'm amazed to see, including the politician, including everybody, teachers, sitting and for mindfulness of training for 10 minutes. And sometimes they want to go longer. I have time limit because I have to finish the class within 45 minutes. So I ring the bell. You can open your eyes now, you know, something like that. So, you know, we sh I mean, the question and answer is that we must engage the local communities, the local political people, also at the, at the federal and provincial level. Yes, Dr. Daniel Taylor. We won't hear it on that. There's a concluding story to your empowerment of women and your charm uh, <laughs> stories that follows on the prior question, which is please tell everybody what happened when the government withdrew the financial support to the 56,000 <laughs> volunteer yes. w women that you trained, health yes, workers, yes, yes. and what the political consequences were when the, these 56,000 women mobilized <laughs> to the fall of the government. <laughs> I must tell you one thing, you know, because thank you for reminding me of this. You know, Nepal has gone through many political phases in my during my lifetime, okay? I told you I was I was a girl when education was legal. But we went through many phases. One of the phases came when monarchy, absolute monarchy, became a, a constitutional monarchy in 1990. So at that time, our so-called Democratic Party, Congress Party, Nepali, Nepal, Nepali Congress Party, the very ancient, you know, Democrats. So they were in the power. They 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 got they they were elected at, to form the government. But what they thought that all these female community health care training that we were doing, it all belonged to the monarchy system. So you know what they did? The most foolish act. What they did was, okay, you know, we, we used to bring the female community health volunteers once every month to the health institutions. And we used to pay them their uh, lost wages for spending time with us. So 100 rupees, which is what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and Congress Party, who came into power, thought that, oh, these people are from the old regime. They are, you know, the monarchy system. They cut it out. That hundred rupees, that one dollar. You know what happened? The Congress Party lost election at the ground level, at the local level. And UML got it. UML means United Marxist Leninist Party. They learned the lessons. And Nobody could remove female community health volunteers. The ground, they are the community, they are the powerful people. And some of them are even elected now in the house, in the, in the local level, the provincial level. They are very empowered. I recently contacted some, in, encountered interactions with the female. They are not the same as I had trained. They are more educated, they are well-dressed, they, they can speak, they can speak their mind out, you know. I mean, in my time, they were mostly illiterate. Although they were very intelligent, they could do. They could learn the techniques. But now, you know, they are different ball of game. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> do we have time for one more question? Hi, Dr. Tava. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, so, four years ago, we had the Almada Declaration, and we stand here four years later, still talking about the same subjects, about placing primary health care at the center of, uh, of global health and services. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if you think um, we have failed to accomplish the Alma Data Declaration, and if so, what is one lesson that you can maybe give us to the new generations to avoid repeating the same mistakes of, of, that, uh, of the um, event? I don't know whether I understood it. Uh, did you ask me whether we failed Almata Declaration? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> no. 
As you see, the Nepal case study, we didn't fail. Actually, we enacted the Almata Declaration. But many other countries are also doing, you know. And you see, we cannot do everything at a time because we are in different, different phases and different, different situations and different, different, you know, uh, political systems, you know. So I, I would not call we have ever failed. You know, some of the other countries also, you know, they have come up. Look at how, how did we got rid of polio? How, what did it cause? Polio eradication, now we don't have it. They mobilize multi-sectors. Even the bus drivers were involved into this. And across the countries, we gave polio drops uh, across India and Nepal, you know, at the same day, millions of children. What did that? I don't think primary health care has failed, really. What, what, what has failed, maybe, we didn't try hard enough, you know. This is where, and you know, any project, any, any, any agenda, you, you cannot get everything up. There is always an unfinished agenda, unfinished task. So that are the unfinished tasks. Let's not call that failure. Let's do it. Thank you. So we can continue our conversation outside at the Wall of Wonder where there's a, a reception, and I welcome you all out. And let us give us one more thank you for our guests. <laughs> one more time, I would like to thank you. You inspire me. I feel I'm, you know, very old ancient public health worker, but today you gave me the feeling that I'm still relevant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.